Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Man Cave 4301 podcast. I'm your host, Big Kev. Thank you very much for tuning in. If you guys like this podcast and uh, you think that someone could benefit out of it, please, please, please share it with your on, on your Facebook or Instagram. Uh, share the link from YouTube if there is a link there for it. Uh, I really appreciate all the support that I'm getting and uh, the, the further we can get this out and the more stories that we can get told, uh, the better. So if you yourself want to tell your story uh, or you know someone that has a story that they would like to tell, please get in contact with me at mancave4301 at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, so go and check me out over there. You can get me on Messenger. Um, probably not on the Man Cave Messenger because it doesn't give me notifications and it, and it keeps playing up, so I can't really read any of the messages um, or get notifications for those messages. So just check me out on my p uh, personal page, Ella Stratford. Um, you'll see a, a photo up there um, of my ugly mug once I change it. And uh, yeah, please get in contact with me and, and we'll get some more stories out there and we can help some more people. So very excited for the next guest because she's my first female on the show that uh, is telling their story individually or know that uh, Josh had his partner in here and Maladjusted Monkeys had their part, um, uh, Shane's partner was in here as well, Madison. So um, this is the first episode where a female guest is telling her individual story. So I'm really, really happy for this milestone. Um, it's, uh, it's something that I've been waiting to do for a, a while now. So I just want uh, you guys to know that it's all inclusive. It's not just because it's called the Man Cave doesn't mean it's just men that come in here. So if, uh, if you want to tell your story, ladies, uh, get in contact with me. So without further ado, let's get into this podcast. It's going to be awesome, full of energy, and I cannot wait for you to hear it. So here we go. And just before we get into it, full disclosure, it was peeing down with rain. So it may get a little bit hard to hear, and that's what the white noise is. So yeah, lots of rain, lots of noise. So uh, yeah, just bear with it. My next guest joined the military in 1988 at the young age of 17. She joined the Ordnance Corps and near the end of her service changed to intelligence. She deployed to Timor and Bougainville PNG. She was medically discharged after 13 years when her life was turned upside down when diagnosed with stage 5 cervical cancer. After studying a very successful career in the mining sector, she is now the founder and director of the new project Wellness Igniter. Elaine Gallagher, welcome to the podcast. Hey, hey. Alice, <laughs> so good to finally meet you. She's a ball of energy, guys, so you're in for a good one. Yeah, I had a double shot of coffee after my swim session today, so look out. <laughs> and we just had a big feed, so yeah, we're ready to go. Well, ready I'm ready to, to go. I'm ready to go to sleep. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> well, we usually start this podcast with asking, why did you get into the military? Well... At the age of 17, I was a bit of a rebel, actually. Um, it was, yeah, one of the, the blackest sheep in my family. So um, very, very rebellious. Um, and, uh, you know, I knew I needed some sort of authority. And um, it was getting to the stage where I went, well, I, can't, I didn't re really have good grades to go to uni. And I knew I had to um, pull my socks up. So, yeah, decided to join the army. So your first day joining the army, was it, did it meet your expectations or did you just like freak out? Was it like a shock to your system or you're like, this is what I need? Both, a bit of both. Uh, so 17, you know, you think, um, you know, you, you, you're still hot, hot stuff, but, you, but you're not. So the section commanders are ripping down your throat and um, yeah, it's probably what I really needed in life. Um, and I'm really glad I joined to tell you the truth. I mean, sometimes I think at the age of 49, it'd be really good to, if there was an experiment where you could go back at this age and do Kapuka again, gee, it would be so much different. But um, no, I'm really proud of my service and um, I'm really glad I joined, yeah. So you join Ordnance Corps. 
Yeah, so the Royal Australian Army Ordnance Course. So I joined as a Clark Tech. Um, yeah, it was it, it was good. I um, I really enjoyed it. But um, later on down down the track, I knew I wanted to do something different, and um, yeah, applied to get into uh, OSINT, say so Intelligence Corps, and a uh, whole lot of test things that you had to to do before you get um, selected and and you know um, pass the test to say hey come on board. Um, so I did all that and successfully got in and um, was an operator intelligence. So with the ordnance side of things, can you explain a little bit of that role, what it's all about, what kind of work you guys do? Yeah, so as a Clark Tech, you know, basically behind the computer. So um, it was to support the units around you. So if somebody wanted um, some uh, ammunition or stores or whatever, you know, there's a whole lot of paperwork that you need to go through. The paperwork would come to the Clark Techs, like myself. We do the paperwork, um, fill, fill that out, and then that will go to the store people, so the yardies. And then the yardies will go out and select those stores, and off it goes to the... Um, supporting the unit that wanted uh, the stores. Yep. We've had uh, an ordinance guy on here before, mm -hmm. Ryan Bowen. Um, it was quite an interesting sort of job that he had. He was pretty much maybe a step or two after you. And, um, yeah, no, it was really good. Got to jump out of planes and stuff, so it was exciting. Yeah, <laughs> the only exciting thing that um, we had as a dual occupation was um, when I went to a field force unit, um, I had to drive a truck, so I had to learn how to drive a Unimog, um, which was fun. And I, um, in my time, that's another podcast, but I did burn down a Unimog with um, parts <laughs> worth a million dollars. But uh, as I said, that's uh, for another podcast, I think. <laughs> no, no, we can go and do it here. <laughs> yeah. Come on, tell us how it happened. Uh, yeah, okay. So, um, <laughs> look, to cut a long story short, I was posted to an aviation unit and and, um, you know, we just rocked up. Can't remember what exercise it was. Maybe it was a kangaroo exercise. Or I'm not too sure. So driving, putting up the Unimog with my digger and um, took out the, uh, you know, campfire stove. And um, it was pretty cold in that area. So, you know, look, lit it up and obviously... Um, you know, looking back on it, it was, it, it was quite, quite frightening because it actually blew up and um, got out of the cam net in time because the whole cam net and, and truck blew. And um, I was very lucky um, and, you know, because it did happen to a couple of couple of people, including the Padre, and, and um, you know, um, they did share the story that they, you know, could turn turn off the the off switch on the gas gas burner in time. But in my case, it was too late. So basically, um, yeah, uh, helicopter parts or a million dollars gone down the drain. Um, you know, there was no blame put on me. Um, inv investigation did happen and it was, look, it was the O-rings and some sort of weather conditions and so it wasn't suitable. It was out, out of your control. So out, to of, speak. out of my control, yeah. Look, I mean, look, looking back on it, it was quite funny, but... You know, there was a serious side of it and, and, you know, I had all the jokes, you know, put, put, put another mog on the fire, you know, all those songs and all that. So, look, uh, yeah, look, I, I, a bit, bit of trauma for me because now I, I don't like lighting up gas, you know, bottles or having a barbecue, hence me having an electric barbecue at home. And, oh, um, wow. Yeah, yeah. Really? So it really scarred me because I do I don't have a barbecue at home because I I'm shit scared of lighting up a, you know, barbecue these days. So I don't wow. do that. Wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and so many years <laughs> after, like. So many. Yeah. I I it's refuse. Just something you've never won't, felt comfortable won't, with. Won't have any gas bottles in my home. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Far out. That's a good story. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you didn't expect that. In no, the I didn't. No, you didn't <laughs> even mention anything in that before we met. Well, after you know, after all the training that we've done today with podcasting, <laughs> that never came up. I'm so glad that well, we saved that for the podcast. Yeah. So, boot camp. We we love to hear a good boot camp story. Just the fuckery and and oh. just the crazy stuff that you got up to when you when you did get up to something crazy when you weren't being grilled for anything. Oh, look. Back in those days, you know, look, I joined in 1988. There was, so there was no such thing as racism or um, bastardization. And, and I really liked those days, you know. Like I think um, 
our society is quite wrapped up in cotton wool. So I really liked being yelled and shouted at. It was good character building. And I think that's what we're missing in today's, um, you know, Kapuka, you know, the boot camps. Because um, I think that's what I really needed as, as a 17-year-old recruit. I think if somebody was to be lenient to me, I would still be that asshole. you know. Um, mm. So it certainly did build character. Um, look, I enjoyed my time at Kapuka. Um, you know, I did miss it when we marched out, but we actually stayed there. Yeah, a couple of days because we got quarantine. I think for some sort of flu or I can't remember. There was some some sort of epidemic going on, so we actually got quarantine. Um, so yeah, and then went off to our um, initial training. So went off to Bandiana to do my um, Clark Tech training. So really enjoyed boot camp. Um, you know, I wasn't very physically fit back then, um, so I struggled a lot. But I got through it and um, like now I look back and I think, wow, I wish I could do it all again because, you know, I've just found the um, fitness side again. I'm so pumped. You know, I, I love training. I love keeping my mind and body healthy and, you know, I just love, love swimming, cycling and mm. and all those sort of things that I never really enjoyed when I was 17 years old. Do you think you'd appreciate it more now going back? D- Definitely. Like with, with this mindset. like you'd, De- Definitely. I mean, yeah. if, if they said, hey, Elaine, you know, do you want to have another shot at Kapuka, you know, as an experiment, I would say, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm even thinking <laughs> about maybe we could do some sort of reality TV, right, where, yeah. where we <laughs> can go, all right, who wants to go back to Kapuka as a 50-year-old and do all your recruit training again with, you know, all that yelling and shouting? Yeah. I, think, I think it would be awesome. Yeah. I think uh, one of the things that's been on my mind, and I didn't want to ask this question, but I, oh, the curiosity is getting the better of me. But being a woman, do you think the treatment was any different? You got grilled just the same? or And, and sort of what was it like? I, I want to ask it once, but what was your experience as a female soldier uh, at that time? Look, but again, I don't think there was any... Um, yeah, look, I think we got grilled equally the same you know like um there was a lot of shouting but then it was just performance right you look back and you think well that's their job that's the corporals and sergeants and you know the section commanders that's their job to build your character so you know um i think of it as as a performance um so yeah you know come to think of it it was actually quite nice to be yelled and screamed at and and put a little bit of discipline into how to make your bed properly, how to fold your clothes. So, you know, like now, I'm very OCD, you know. Like if you come to my house, you know, everything's neat and tidy. You know, I'm a bit of a minimalist. And I think that's that's um, a big thanks to my um, training at Kapuka too. You know, I'm very, very neat and clean person. I like everything mm. in order. Um, so, yeah, I, I think... Um, I don't think there was any special treatments. I think uh, they, ha- they had a job to do, and I think they successfully did it, those section commanders, yeah. Mm. Oh, that's awesome. Mm. But And you didn't cop any flak from your, your peers or anything like that? Not at all. No? No, that's no. great. No, I'm still a bit of a larrikin then and still try to be a larrikin now. So, <laughs> no, definitely... Um, I, I don't get that vibe. <laughs> <laughs> Very, look, I, I try to... Uh, you know, treat people the way I want to be treated. And I think it's very, uh, you know, coming up to being 50, I think in my current situation now, it's nice to be kind and compassionate, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying I'm an angel, but um, I do um, like to give people a second chance because, you know, there was a period in my time where um, I I would want that second chance, you know. I think, um, I think everybody deserves that second chance. Yeah. yeah. So your first deployment is to East Timor. East Timor. I'm just trying to get, get, get <laughs> that was so long ago, right? So I'm just trying to um, figure this out. So yeah, definitely, definitely it was East Timor. Yes. And what so, year? What year was that? Oh look, it was a long time ago. I really can't remember. My long-term memory is sort of a bit shit at the moment. Um, so yeah, I, I really couldn't tell you, but. Uh, 
It was East Timor and... Um, was it around, around about the start when, when it first kicked off or...? Yeah. Because that yeah. was about 99. Yeah, when it first kicked off. So, um, so yeah, it was East Timor because, like, the Bougainville, that's when the diagnosis, uh, which we haven't gone into, so I'll leave that. But uh, yeah. that's when the diagnosis happened. But um, East Timor, yep, yeah, um, you know, really, really, in, um, you know, opened up my eyes and... Um, it, it, it was really funny because there's, there's a bit of a story here. Um, so we had an interpreter. Um, he was only a young boy, maybe 17, 18. And uh, he was our interpreter, so mine and my sergeants. And um, I used to give him clothes and money. And, you know, I just wanted to share everything with him because he looked after our team. And, um, you know, before I left for East Team, I gave him all my clothes, even, even the shorts that were female because he had nothing so anyway what 20 years down the track um i get a facebook friends request from this guy and it's like just about to cancel it when i read his little message and went hey what? hey elaine do you remember me and um basically i've been trying to find you and get this he became a politician what so, so uh now if you're listening to this um i'm talking about you now so this guy who really had was so ambitious and but had nothing is now a politician in East Timor. That's so, insane. So he said, I will never forget you. So, you know, it's really nice to be kind to people because he said, I will never forget you, Alain, and when I get elected and become president, you're going to come working for me. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I keep in touch with him and he's met, he's met Obama, he's met oh, so wow. many amazing people and... He uh, tried to get the defence attaché to look for me, um, but he only knew me as, hey, Elaine from Australia. And, um, yeah, he pulled a lot of punches to try and find me and, um, lo and behold, found me on Facebook. That is amazing. Yeah, yeah. That is so cool. Oh, I'm so proud of him. And look where he is now, you know, from nothing to a successful politician. Yeah. Gee whiz. Yeah. What was your... Uh, your take on the, sort of the atmosphere over there and and all this you know all the shit that was going on I mean you, did you get caught up in much of it or uh, not really look I was in intelligence school when I got um, deployed over there so it was for you know five, five months I think five or you know five or six months so basically it was just patrolling collecting information collecting intelligence yep taking it back to the commander writing a brief and then just you know um, oh, so that was actually a field role Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, you know, and, and just, um, you know, giving that back to the, to, to our commander and then, oh, he, he'll brief, you know, he'll brief um, the top echelons. But, um, yeah, look, it, it was an eye-opener. I, um, I really got to, you know, I love talking, Alice, you know, and I really, really um, made a lot of, well, as you can say, friends, you know, like uh, try to get the trust of the community over mm. there and, so it was quite sad leaving those people behind too. But, um, you know, we had a job to do and, you know, we, we had to do it. And, um, look, I, I, it was a long deployment. Yeah, of course I miss my family and all that, but, um, you know, really um, glad to be part of that um, deployment, yeah. So you finish up there. How long is it until you go to Bougainville? Okay, so, yeah, again, I deployed in Bougainville when um, I was in Inc. Corps. So... Um, as I said, my long-term memory, I'm, I'm not really sure, but um, that was a, a peacekeeping role. So, you know, um, there was no weapons or anything involved. So it was purely peacekeeping. Um, and uh, we had some civilians who were AFP and um, from other government organisations in, in our little um, house that joined us as well. So, again, same thing, collecting information, um, met some pretty key people in Bougainville, you know, um, and uh, really got to know the community, really got to know the people, just really, um, just, it was just nice to be there and r know what um, these, this community, you know, was going through with the Indonesians and, and like without being, you know, sounding too, too much on whatever side, um, you know, the Bogan, Boganvillians were obviously a bit pissed off with the Indonesians and, and, you know, so you had to really play a neutral part because you were having to work with the Indonesian um, 
soldiers as well as having to yeah, work with you had the to be the moderator. So, so yeah, definitely, yeah. You, you definitely had to be neutral. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, obviously, one side was doing wrong by the other. Yeah. Yeah. So you you're obviously showing a bit more compassion for one side, and I mean, you you work with the other side. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So to make it work, to to find that sort of harmony. You, you definitely had to um, just be neutral. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Uh, how, long deployment? Again, about five months. Yeah. Yep. Five okay. months. Came home. Um, I think it was time for me to get out. I, I was working. I was pretty fit back then. You know, I was running marathons and really fit. Um, and uh, and then um, got posted to Perth because uh, my family were there. And my mum, mum was... Uh, yeah, she was getting really sick, so I wanted to get posted to Perth, hence, you know, my posting to a security section there. And um, part of the medical was uh, females had to get a pap smear. So it was like, yeah, no big deal because I um, had my regular pap smear chest. Um, and um, and then it was like, oh, Corporal Gallagher, uh, you need to come and see us. And then it was like, oh, you need to go and see this uh, oncologist. And that was like, gone oncologist, oncologist. It was like, what the fuck's an oncologist? So it was like a cancer specialist, right? Mm. So had a female um, on gone oncologist, oncologist examine me and, and basically said, this is quite quite severe, Elaine. You know, we think you've you've got cancer, but let's not get too excited. Let me put you on to one of the highest specialists in, in Perth, Dr. Um, Ian Hammond, which I had to wait the weekend. So it was like, Ugh. holy shit. And then, um, yeah, so Ian um, gave me the news and said, yeah, stage five cancer, which um, was like, well, okay, what does that mean? It's like, what's the, ho- the most highly aggressive ca- cervical cancer lane? So my sister Linda came with me when he broke the news to me and basically it was a weekend. I remember it was a Friday and he said, I really want this emergency sur- surgery to happen on the Monday. And it's like, well, what's the surgery? It's a, it's a hysterectomy. So it's like at the age of 29, Shit. it was like, you got to have a hysterectomy because it's stage five. And it's like, well, what if I don't have the hysterectomy? It's like, you die. And it's like, fuck, all right. So... Had 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 the weekend, um, and then straight into surgery on the Monday, and got everything taken out. Yeah, which um, you know, it was a speedy recovery because I was pretty fit, and um, he was quite surprised as well, um, and said, you know, Lane, it due to your fitness, um, you know, I was I was had a really good recovery, mm-hmm. um, and um, and that's when. It sort of went sour with, I wouldn't say with the ADF or with DVA or any, well, I think, I think it was just my supervisor at the time, a warrant officer who was a complete ass, mm. you know, um, which led me to go, stuff this, why, why do I want to stay in the army mm. when you're not letting me do anything? And back, back in those days, it was pretty hard because I was living like maybe half an hour away and... Like, we've got it pretty good now in, in the military, but back then it's like, well, you got to report for duty. It's like, well, I can't drive a car, so how, you, how, you, how, how am I going to report? So he wanted me to drive in a car after having a hysterectomy to report oh, to duty. Okay. Oh, my next question was going to be, oh, so looking back on it, did you think his things were warranted? But no, that's a dick move. Yeah. Yeah, that's a real fucking dick move. And, and, and I wouldn't mind going to work, but um, firstly, I didn't have any you know, recovery. And uh, secondly, it was like when I did rock up to work, um, he actually treated me like a leper. So I actually Fuck. wasn't doing anything. Back in those days, there wasn't any Facebook or anything. I would have done Facebook if I if I could. But uh, <laughs> but basically, yeah, yeah, I I actually did no work. So it so my depression was so severe, like coming to work and and making me do nothing, that I actually went and saw the padre and said, I don't know what to do. You know, I had a very successful career in the army, mm. and it got to the point where this this person was actually letting me down, and um, I made the decision to 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 discharge and um, they weren't going to let me. So I actually requested a, an interview, which I had with the highest medical 
officer, naval officer, and um, he was very sympathetic and he said, we can't, we can't discharge you alone due to our duty of care. And I said, well, I'm actually doing nothing. Uh, you know, if you gave me some work, I, it would be a different story, but I'm actually doing nothing. I'm coming to work, sitting down, doing nothing. And um, I said, you need to do something, otherwise I, I'll, I'll take you to the media if I have to. So he said, look, I sympathise with you. The only way you're going to get out is by medical discharge. I said, bring it on. Let's do it. Because um, it was actually, as, as I said, it wasn't, it wasn't the defence force that was letting me down. It was just some, you know. Just one guy. Just some arseholes there. And, you know, we've yeah. heard it on the podcast here before that, you know, with, with many of them, the, there's just that one guy that mm. just ruins it for everyone, you mm. know. So it, it's not an uncommon story. And unfortunately, it had to happen to you. So Yeah. And as I said, I loved, I loved my career. Um, but um, I went on to better and bigger things, you know, um, and um, had a very successful career in the uh, resource industry. Mm. And... Um, and then I just took a break, just just needed a break. And then now what, I'm... What, once you got out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, studied studied occupational health and safety. It wasn't big at that time, but I knew it was going to get big. Mm. And um, listened to my gut and, yeah, it led me to the resource industry, which, um, fantastic money, you know, mm. um, absolutely amazing money I was making. Um, did, did over, you know, 13 years in that, but needed a break and then... Um, you know, started working with the veterans community just with mm. welfare and advocacy and, yeah. I just want to go back a bit there with um, with coming out and you're talking about your depression and all that sort of stuff. Mm. What sort of, what was that stem from? Was that from uh, from a culmination of, because I, I imagine that, you know, your, your cancer, I mean, that's a big one. But was there anything in your military career that... Uh, culminated on top of that or with that contribute uh, look i i think um you know as as a practicing advocate before you know i used to as i said i used to uh, be an advocate and, and a welfare officer when i look back on my situation i mean i haven't really shared most of my stuff with even with my specialist because i feel like um i don't know I, I just I just don't feel like I'm ready to talk about shit even after like 20 years mm. um, but I but I do know that um, some of the trauma that people I can only speak on my behalf I can't really speak of uh, of anyone else but I know that things do happen to you in the military and and um, you know the the cancer one will you know sort of like a it's a cliche but it was a blessing in disguise for me because it actually made me get off my ass and you know, I was a very goal oriented person, started doing marathons, you know, kicked off New York Marathon, which I never thought I would do, you know, all, all these things that I would never thought I would ever do, you know, gave me a second chance, I suppose, when, when I was diagnosed. And um, I think some of the things that are happen, happening to some of my friends are actually happening to them in childhood or adolescence. So it catches up and it goes out of control because they don't seek any help and then things happen and they join the military and then it's a combination of lots of stuff for me you know the depression anxiety you know whatever you want to call it ptsd it was definitely a combination of things that have happened prior to the military and then things that happened in kapuka as i said when i look look back at the kapuka days you know i don't take offense to any of those stuff because it's I, I feel like it needed to happen like I it wouldn't worry me if somebody called me a Asian Asian bitch or whatever right, like I, yeah. I, I'll look yeah. back at that in humor um, I mean it'd be a different story if nowadays you know um, mm. but but back in those days you know I'll look back and I, I, I don't take offense to those sort of stuff back in those days 19, 1988 it's essentially built your thicker skin yeah, definitely. Um, but um, I think um, for me, you know, I don't know. There's there's a lot of things that have happened in my past um, that I haven't really shared with, with anybody yet, which maybe I will one day, you know, on another podcast. But, um, but I definitely needed to take a break, which I did. 
and then you know it's taken me a while to sort myself out mm. um, and I'm pumping now like I'm ready to return back to work I'm so I'm so grateful to my rehab and and also DBA like I I know they get a, a fair bit of shit thrown at it at them and you know as an advocate I do see it but um you know I'm ready to to go back to work in the mental health field and just try and inspire get the ripple effect going to to you know get that person to go you know what I'm still young I can do this Let, let's go ahead and Let's do something with our lives, eh, instead of um, mm. sitting back and just... Well, you, you see this with a lot of, uh, a lot of people that get cancer and, or, or, or some, some sort of medical thing, right, yep. uh, life-threatening thing. And it just, you know, they, a, a common saying is it's a blessing in disguise because it's made me a more active person, pa- compassionate person. It's made me, made me this and made me that. And I, th- I, th- I think it's absolutely right. I mean, once, you, once you're once you faced with your own mortality and you realise how precious your life is, then, you know, you go on to do great things. And you're doing that now. I mean, you've had a successful career in the mining industry. Like, you're now, you, you're an advocate for, for veterans. Like, you, you're just meeting you today. I mean, you're just an amazing person. I... I I can't speak highly enough of you. Like you're energetic. You just, you just ooze com- like just passion, and you just uh, and at fifty years old. You're nearly doing, fifty. Nearly fifty <laughs> years old. Sorry, you're gonna throw some shit across the table at me. Nearly fifty years old. You're gonna go and do a half marathon. Like it's, you're just. No, that's a half Ironman. Oh, oh <laughs> Ironman. So there you go. I mean. <laughs> It's just an incredible. It's just I, incredible. You're, you you're really inspiring. No, thank you. I thank you. I um, look. I I, I just didn't want to live life like I was living for the past couple of years. I, I I really, I think um, what's helped me is me paying for a mindset coach in um, Brett Robinson. So I met him through um, something that YVSS, which is a veterans organisation down at Corumban. Um, you know they put on they put on a. a a workshop and um you know i i really gelled to this guy i don't know why so i took action i gave him a business card um and i just emailed him the next day and and you know i started taking action for things now instead of going oh yeah that that was good alice and then you know not doing anything about it but now you know i've taken ownership and action so it's like if i want something it's like yep yeah, how much um, and I and I feel the real value of paying now because I feel that when I pay for someone's service, you know, that I'm going to put in a 200%. Yeah, you want your money's worth out of it. You, yeah. you spent your hard-earned money on it. You want to get something out of it. Yeah. So you put as much as you can into it to get as much back from it. Yeah. So yeah. I know that I've grown. I definitely have. And, you know, a bit more wise, I suppose. And, um, you know, just really enjoying what I'm doing at the moment and, um, you know, with the mindset coaching and losing some weight and having some amazing um, people around me, you know, that's it all helps for you mm. to excel. Uh, yeah, I think surrounding yourself, uh, I say this all the time, surrounding yourself with good people, you feed off that and it's just, it just does you, the world, a good say. So. Yeah, you have to. Community, people, family, it all makes a difference. Yep, yep. yep. So tell us a little bit about... Your business. Oh, okay. Let's get into that. Yes, give me a plug. So, well, <laughs> Wellness Igniter. Yeah, do you like the name? I do, I do, yeah. 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 Okay, I like it too. <laughs> so, everyone's on Wellness Igniter, not me. So, I wanted to have a podcast. I just didn't want it to be another, you know, podcast talking about mental health. I wanted it to be pretty raw. So, I actually went on to do the Prince Trust um, course. So um, it was it. It's been pretty hard to get onto in the previous, you know, years before. But now um, it's kind of easy. So it's free for veterans. So if you're a veteran listening, jump on it because I highly recommend it. So it's um, it's for veterans who want to be business owners or entrepreneurs, right? So uh, so I went along to this um, course. I really liked it, um, and I thought, wow, you know, I I do want to have a small business as a hobby on the side. So. 
something that I'm passionate about. So I'm passionate about yoga. So I do yoga and I do meditation. Um, and the meditation has immensely helped me. Um, and, you know, trying to keep calm because I'm a very angry person and, and I've noticed that I try to, you know, keep calm nowadays and not let the silly things bother me. And um, so I did this podcast and then I got invited to Brisbane, the Commonwealth Bank Innovation Hub. So I had a team of two civilians who helped me um, with um, my business. So we had, I had three minutes to um, present it to the Innovation Hub and to my peers. And uh, yeah, so it was just me to take action, hence seeing you today to try and get this podcast up and going. So what it is, is, is uh, yoga. So I teach yoga every Sunday for the next couple more months. Um, with uh, GoTo Health and uh, in conjunction with the University of Technology of Sydney, who's doing a study f with veterans with chronic illness. And um, so I teach every Sunday at Gaythorn from 10 to 11. It's a study. Um, and then um, I wanted to do this podcast on mental health, like Rise Up Recovery. I don't want to talk too much about your trauma. I want to talk about your recovery because that's important. I want to talk about how you went from here to here, you know, from zero to hero. And um, it's focused not just ADF veterans, it's focused on youth, Indigenous, refugees, anybody, anybody's story is worth um, being told. And um, there's a lot of people that don't ask for help and they do listen to podcasts. You know, I've had a lot of fly and fly out mates who have tapped me on the shoulder to say, that's good what you're doing, Lane. I don't see a counsellor, but I really like what you've what you've done on social media. So I try not to use social media for an ego thing. I, I'm trying to use it as a, how can this help you? Um, so if it's inspiring someone, then I've done my job. Mm. So, you know, that's what social media is for me at the moment. So I'm really enjoying it and uh, been making up some t-shirts and I believe in giving back. So part of those proceeds would go to a non-profit of anyone's choice that's you know that wants to be involved and you know if you go hey let's give to the domestic violence group so be it let's do that so it's really important for me to support the community as well it would be good for the community to pitch in there and give you ideas of where the stuff where the money can go as well so mm. you know you can sell a few t-shirts and, and build up a bit of money and say hey guys who do you think needs some help yeah. You know, this month or this quarter or whatever the case may be. And you can just inject a bit of cash into there and and just help whoever you can. Like, yeah. I mean, I think that's a fabulous idea. Especially yeah. if it's something that correlates to uh, what you're doing with the mental health side or the homeless or, or whatever the case may be. So, you know, I really like that idea. Yeah, well, my goal, um, you know, I really had a very successful career with mining and, um It'd be nice to go back there as a wellness coach or something like that. But um, my passion is really youth. You know, I think uh, some of our youths um, get forgotten mm. or just need that little bit of little extra love to say, hey, you yeah. know, um, mm. youth Indigenous, that's that's the track that I'm aiming down for. And I think that's a really good idea because, you know, working, I, I work security and um, a lot of the youths that we have issues with are ind Indigenous youths. Um, you know, yep, they're a pain in the ass, but I get what's going on. Like, I, I'm always nice to them. Um, and until they play up, I'm good. You know, like, you always approach them with respect, say please and thank you, and, and just treat them like human beings, mm -hmm. you know, because the last thing that they need is some angry security guard going up and just busting their balls for the, for what, you know? So I think it's really good. I think they need some some guidance and just a little bit of love, you know, because they, a lot of them don't come, come from broken homes. They, mm -hmm. they do come from broken homes. And um, I'd really like to see change in there myself because it's heartbreaking to see these kids out there at 12, 1 o'clock in the morning wandering the streets, you know? What kind of life is that for a kid? Yeah. You know, they should be in bed with a full belly, you know. Mm. So I think that's a brilliant idea. I really love the concept. Yeah, so I'm in the process this year now to return back to work. So do 
a couple of study first and then um, slowly get back into work. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is really important, especially for young veterans. Well, I'll consider myself a young veteran. So, you know, young veterans like me who are ready to go back to work. You know, we've got a system there that's in place to help us. So use it. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. What, where do you... Where do you see this all in five years? Have you got a, a bigger plan? Look, you know, I'm a bit of a goal setter, a bit of a visualisation <laughs> person, you know, um, thinking big these days, you know, instead of thinking small. But um, I definitely um, would like to see, you know, Wellness Igniter um, grow. You know, it's, it's, it's a hobby for me. I'm not here to make a million bucks out of it. You know, but if my T-shirt sells and all that can help an organisation with whatever it is, homeless use or whatever, then, then I'm happy with that. Um, in the meantime, personal goals for myself is to, to remain in the mental health um, community, you know, um, still doing my veterans, ADF veterans work, you know, on the side though, but uh, exploring um, avenues of working in like youth detention or juvenile, Indigenous, um, definitely can see myself having a, a long lasting career in that section. Mm. Yeah. Yep. What is the push for young kids? What is for, the push? For, for you, like, I hate to ask, but is it sort of like a maternal thing that you haven't been able to experience that have really drawn you to the youth? Um, yeah, yeah, probably. I, I love kids. I yep. love kids and I love dogs. Yeah, you know, I really got to have do. your fur babies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I really, I'm really drawn to kids. I really love kids, and because I, because you know, being nearly fifty, I, I don't act my age. That's for sure. Um, no, no, and I, and I don't, I don't want to act my age unless I have to. Um, but I think I've got that really good rapport with them. Um, yeah. And um, you know, I just, I, I really. You know, I'm just really passionate about meeting new people. And I, without being inquisitive and uh, a sticky bee, I just really want to know what makes them tick. Them tick. Yeah. I really like really good conversations. Yeah. I'm using that word a lot, aren't I, really? No, so, but it's good. Like, I, you know, I talk to these kids one-on-one, -on -one, you know, when, when you see one of them randomly just walking around and say, hey. What are you doing out this late? Yeah. You know, you start a conversation. Yeah. You say, well, what are you doing, man? Yeah. Like, and, and sometimes they open up. Yeah. Sometimes I'll give you a real big bullshit story as well. Yeah, yeah. But it's the same thing. It's the same fascination with why. I mean, I'm a very inquisitive person myself. <laughs> mm. Hence the podcast. I love asking questions. Yeah. And, and knowing, getting to know people. And uh, it, it, it really does make my mind think what what are these kids thinking what are they actually going through you know yeah what because i mean the more information that we get from them mm. the better chances we have at helping them because it, we know what they're after what they need and all that sort of stuff but they just find it hard to open up sometimes yeah ex ex exactly and you just got to have really good rapport uh you know mm. I, I trust my gut instinct and be, be, being a investigator and the mining for accidents and incidents, you know, these are the questions, you know, why, 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 why? So I, I really like human connection. I like uh, meeting people. I think, um, you know, um, we all play a part in society, you know, like I try not to, you know, I'm still learning, but I'm trying not to judge these days, um, especially now that I'm trying to carve a career in mental health. So no judgments. <laughs> You know, try not to judge. Um, that's the most important thing. I think um, if someone's going through a rough time, instead of abandoning them like most of us do, you know, I think it's quite important if you're in that community to reach out and offer them some help or some phone numbers and then that's it. You know, you're not a counsellor. You just leave it for mm. the counselling. But um, And if they don't want your help, well, you know... You, you really can't push it. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, as soon as you start pushing, they'll pull away. Yeah. yeah and you won't get anywhere. So, yeah. uh, and, and like you said, building that rapport with them as well. Like, like I said, I, I don't go up and bust their balls. I'd be polite. You know, if they can trust me, then that's bet they're better off. Mm. You know? Yeah. So, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, your podcast, we're going we're gonna to do something, a little something today. Yeah. We're going to do something. And, I love it. And, and we're going to get it started. Let's get, and I'm so grateful, grateful, so grateful, Alice. Thank you so it's much. My pleasure. It's yeah. my pleasure. Like, as soon as we got put in contact with each other, I was like, fucking let's do this. Yeah. Because this is going to be so much fun. Like, you know, I'm on a, a Facebook page for podcasting and... Yesterday, I've been I did a video that I've been wanting to do for a long time, and it's to show everyone my setup so I can help other people see what I have yeah. that may suit them. Yeah. So I, I did a video, and I've got some. I don't have a lot of response out of it, but people have appreciated it, and yeah. and and I just hope someone else can get something out of it because look, this is good fun. It, it is, is really good fun. It is good fun, and it's and it's good to get some information when you are that type of person that don't go out. You know, if mm. you don't go out and you do need some help, you know, I do believe podcasts is, is really good to listen to when, when you're stuck in the traffic. Mm. I certainly listen to podcasts, and I do get inspired by a lot of people, and I go, wow, I've, I've got to do that in my life or whatever. So it does help. Yep. Yeah. Well, my push was that uh, Hazard Ground podcast, so... Um, really lit the fire under me to, to get this done. And, and I'm loving every single episode of this, like from the very start when it was so, so bad, it was so bad. Yeah. I cringe every time I, I listen to it. Um, and, and now I, I think I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm really getting better at it and I'm enjoying it more. Like I, I was nervous to do this <laughs> still. Because, yeah. you know, you're yeah. meeting a new person. Yeah. Is, that, is this going to flow right? Are they going to be the right person? Yeah. And uh, and you've been absolutely amazing. Oh, thank you. So <laughs> thank you so much for for coming over and, and having a look at the gear and, and, and wanting to know stuff because I've absolutely loved teaching you what I know. Yeah. So I'm no, I'm no professional, but I'm pretty sure that... Uh, I appreciate it. You put the work in. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you'll... You'll thrive. Yeah. Thank and I you. mean, I think you're going to be really good at this because you're a talker. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm just saying. <laughs> I know. I'll shut up now. <laughs> no, uh, no, that's fine. That's yeah. what we're here for. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming here. And uh, I, I wish you all the best in the future. Yeah. Thanks for having me on the Man Cave. Yeah, we've <laughs> talked about that as well, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I feel privileged. You should. Yeah. You should. Because it's uh it's an invite only. Yeah. Oh, no, well, no, it's not. Go. It's not really. <laughs> Anyone can come on here. So just a, a short uh short thing before the exit is so if if any one that is listening does have a friend or themselves that wanna tell a story, then uh contact me at man k four three oh one at gmail.com or you can get me on uh, Facebook, Instagram, go and check those out as well. Um, Elaine Gallagher, you can go and find Wellness Igniter. Uh, Do you have a website? Not yet, not yet. Not yet, so you're you're on Facebook or? I'm on Facebook as Elaine Gallagher at the moment, but uh, there'll be an Instagram, um, an Instagram for Wellness Igniter. I'm not really too... Big on the social media sides because, you know, going back to work, I don't want to be spending, spending a lot of time on social media. That's fair. Uh, but definitely there will be Instagram up for Wellness Igniter. So that's where you can find out everything about Wellness Igniter. So, um, yeah, to be continued, that will come up very soon. Yep. Awesome. So we'll uh, end it there. Have you got any questions? No, thanks for having me, Alice. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thanks for, um, for having me on the show and thanks for helping me out. No, not a problem. Anybody else wants a hand? I'm free. Yeah. Well, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Elaine Gallagher, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Cheers, mate.